have this following guest speaker with us today, Dan Flohn, who's the president of Professional Materials Management, also known as PM2. And he's going to be presenting today's topic, measuring the total cost of MRO and quantifying the savings opportunities. And for those of you that don't know Dan, um, I'd like to give a brief introduction. And Dan has over 28 years experience in materials management, process control, and industrial distribution distribution. His particular expertise is in operations management, optimizing inventory, and business process improvement. And Dan has often been published in trade publications and magazines, and is a frequent speaker at conferences, um, including fairly recently um, the eMaint um, user group summit. So I'm always pleased to have Dan with us today. Hey Dan, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Appreciate you having me, Rona. Great. And um, Dan, while we're, um, we have many people on the line who will be logging in, and uh, I just want to make sure your volume is as high as it can be, Dan, because we are recording today's session. And Dan, maybe you can tell us, you know, you've had such a breadth of experience and on such a host of uh, a variety of topics, and what sort of prompted you to put together this particular topic, and why do you think it's important? Well, in, in our years of doing uh, these kinds of projects with, with clients really all across uh, industry, the, the, the most frequent question we seem to get is, you know, uh, how do we cost justify? How do we build a return on investment story for our executives to justify doing whatever it is, this, you know, this initiative that we have in mind to do? We see the, you know, we're experiencing the, the symptoms of the pain that we have, and we know we have to do something, but my executive committee needs to be able to quantify the return on investment for doing that. So th I, that's the, the a very frequent request we get, how do we measure that, and, and that's why I thought it would be a good one to present to, uh, to everyone today. Excellent. Well, based on the response, there's many of our listeners out there really have that, that same pain point. Um, so before I turn things over to Dan, just a few quick housekeeping items for our listeners out there. I do have the phones muted because we're recording today's session, and we'll make sure that we share a link with everyone who attended um, today. And also, Dan has agreed um, to uh, stick around and uh, through the top of the hour if needed and answer any questions you might have. So please feel free to type your questions in at any time during the presentation and then I will ask them of Dan at the conclusion. Also, Dan has agreed to uh, provide a copy of uh, a PDF of today's presentation in case some of you do wish to share it with your management team or your colleagues. And um, so he will also do so. There's a brief survey at the end, and you can indicate that you'd like to get a copy. So I think without further ado, um, Dan, I will turn things over to you. All right. Thanks, Rona, and thanks for everyone for joining today. The the topic, as uh, as we said, was how to measure the total cost of MRO. And there's three three key agenda items I want to touch on today. The first is really identifying the sources of MRO cost, and we'll get into some detail of where those the most frequent sources are of that. And then secondly, measuring measuring your uh, specific costs for your business and give you some techniques to do that that hopefully aren't too painful that you can get to some good quantif uh, quantifying what your cost is and then once you understand what your cost is then being able to then quantify what is the opportunity if you were to make some specific improvements so that you can go to your executive committee and and uh, get the funds set aside to do whatever initiative that you have in mind so those are the three areas we want to try to cover today. And Dan, Rony, we had one, uh, one, oh, sure. Dan, one listener just um, typed in and asked, could you just define MRO for those of our listeners that aren't familiar with the term? Oh, sure. Thanks for asking that. I apologize. Uh, MRO stands for Maintenance, Repair, and Operating Supply. So these are the the, the supplies that you use to maintain your facility or the plant or things of that nature and all of the processes that go around that. We're going to be talking about 
processes and, and purchasing and inventory around uh, MRO today. Okay, great. So, can so we shall we go ahead and launch the poll? Sure. Okay. So um, we have a couple of poll questions. These, your answers will be anonymous, and if you don't mind just typing them right into your keyboard. Um, Dan is wondering, are you planning any significant MRO or maintenance? maintenance, repair, and operating spare parts project this year. Maybe your company wants to do an inventory reduction or update a storeroom or build a storeroom. But let us know if you have any projects going on. All right, so we get a feel for our listeners out there. All right, looks like we've had about 80% of the votes in, so give it a couple more seconds here. And again, just respond yes, no, or you're not really sure. Well, people are still voting. Okay, it looks like we have, um, yeah. Let me go ahead and share the results. It looks like, oh, we have 92% in. Give it a couple more seconds, <laughs> um, and then I'll share the results. Okay. Let's go ahead and share it. So, Dan, what our listeners have told us, 67% are planning a significant spare parts project this year. 14% aren't currently planning one. And about 20%, 19% said they're not sure. Okay. okay? Very, very Back interesting. Back to you. All right, thank you. Are you able to see the full screen okay? Yes, it's coming in okay. great. Very good. Okay. All right. So the first, uh, th uh, the, the three areas of MRO costs we'd like to talk about are inventory cost. Uh, you know, that's the actual physical cost of the of the parts that are on the shelf. The and then the process cost. That's the the, the time and energy that you put into the management of your MRO environment. And then thirdly, the purchasing costs. So there's there's the little phrase that I that I uh, can liken to these three things. You, you you can you can on the inventory cost side, you can buy less uh, to help reduce the amount of inventory you have, or you can buy less often, and that kind of relates to process cost, or you can buy for less. And all three of those things are you know just as important to, to, to take your total cost of inventory down and optimize as best you can. So oftentimes when we go in and we measure these three buckets of cost for our clients, we call that a diagnostic baseline where we're going in and measuring that, those costs. So that's where the, the cost, uh, the, the areas that we're going to be looking at today. Uh, Rona, would you like to, to launch the next poll question? Sure. Let's do that. Our next poll question is, on a scale of 1 to 5, with 5 being best, how would you rate the quality and accuracy of your MRO data? So 5 is excellent, 4 is very good, 3 is average, 2 is fair, 1 is poor. And again, how would you rate the current quality and accuracy of your data when it comes to maintenance and repair spare parts? All right, and again, these answers are anonymous. They're just aggregated so that um, Dan just gets a feel for the audience that he's addressing today. All right, looks like everybody voted. Let me go ahead and share the results with everyone. So it looks like nobody said excellent. OK, that's interesting. 13% very good. 25 said average, 30% said fair, 33% said poor. So I suppose that's part of the reason why people are on the line today, Dan. But, uh, <laughs> just so you all know, you're not alone out there. So all right, back to you. That's right. You're sure not. Uh, the reason I, I wanted to ask that question is, is of course, the quality of the data going in uh, some will obviously impact some of the analysis that, 
that you do. So just you'll need to bear that in mind as you look at the, the inventory analysis steps that we're going to be looking at. Um, it's only as good as the quality of the data going into it. So, so there might be some preliminary steps that you might want to take to, to get the quality of your data up to a certain level so that you can then implement uh, you know, further uh, steps once you have uh, you know, good information to be able to base those decisions on. So, so the first area we wanted to cover today is the, the area of inventory costs. And where are, what are the key sources of, of increased inventory costs when, when, when costs are going up? And we, we, we see this almost everywhere we go. Uh, maybe I have a tainted view of it because people that have a problem are the ones that call me, the ones that don't, don't. But, but I, I see a lot of cases where inventory is growing, and it's, it's for one of four key reasons, and there are others, but this is the most frequent ones that I see. And number one is this is obsolete, that there's, there are machines that are being decommissioned or lines are being decommissioned, but there's no relationship between the parts and their parent machine so that the parts remain in stock and they're, they're remaining on your books and so we see quite a lot of that, where uh, where where there's uh, inventory sitting around that that really doesn't go in any current machine at all. So it's just tying up inventory dollars on on your books. That's one area. The second area is special projects. We see this quite a bit, where there's a special purchase made for a, a very a sizable equipment list and parts list, and then the project gets completed, and those parts get put right back into inventory and so now that's an add to inventory and they're not returned or you know handled in any other way than just put them on the shelf and have them in inventory so those we see that quite a bit where, uh, where there's just uh, you know once or twice a year big projects happen and there's inventory arriving that uh, that you didn't plan for third is excess Meaning, you know, you, and this is the number one cause for this is not knowing how much you use because you're, 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 we're buying just in, 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 as opposed to just in time, we're buying just in case. I'm afraid I don't, you know, I don't know how many I need exactly, so I'm going to make sure that I'm going to buy three instead of the one or two that I know that I need. I want to make sure I have one or two extras available on the shelf. And then the last area is buying around the inventory. Yeah, and the big cause there is again, you know, again, not knowing what you have in stock or don't know uh, where to find it. So, typical story here, uh, you know, an extreme example that I we just uh, saw a few years ago was we were working at a utilities department for a city, and and the the they had a a large crate about the size of a Volkswagen could have gone in this crate, stuffed in the back of the, the lot where all of their transformers were being stored. And we found out that this box was a brand new in the box submersible transformer worth $50,000. And nowhere on the books, they had no idea they even owned it. So in their particular case, they didn't need it anymore. So we were able to you know, help them find a buyer for that. and, and you know, put some significant dollars back into the, the city budget. So, so that was great. And then there was another case where we were working with a recycling plant. And the only person that knew where to find things went on vacation to Puerto Rico. And the first day he was out, the, the, uh, the, the line went down. And they searched for days and days trying to figure out where to find this critical spare, and they couldn't find it, and they wound up buying around it. So for you know, a very, very high dollar part. So I'm sure that you, you've you've probably heard those stories before in your own company, but that's a very large uh, contributor to inventory growth. So the next slide I want to talk with uh, about is then what to measure. We know where the inventory cost, the source is coming from, but what what key things do we want to measure? And some of these might sound, you know, almost uh, you know, elementary, but there are a lot of people we talk to that really don't have uh, information, uh, quality enough information to have a good handle on these. So I, I want to cover the basics here and the, the, the fundamental things. 
N number one is total inventory dollars on hand. Um, a lot of a lot of folks we talk to really don't have a good handle on how much inventory they have, or maybe they have a clear idea of of what inventory is being held in the storeroom, but there are five or six or ten or twelve satellite areas that have parts all over the inventory, uh, all over the plant or the facility. So having a real clear idea of the total of, of what you have on the premises, is that in your accounting system in any way, or that's, is that inside eMaint in any way? So having a good handle on uh, total on hand makes, uh, obviously, it's a good, uh, good starting point. And then annual inventory turn is a good one to measure. Very oftentimes, we see clients have less than one turn a year. That's more than a year's supply of everything on the shelf. It's very typical that we, when, we, when we're brought in to, to work with a client. We had an extreme example not that long ago where their, their, their measured turns for, for their inventory was one-tenth, point one. So they had a 10-year supply of everything on the shelf. So ideally, I would say you'd want to be shooting toward three, maybe even four turns a year, but I think a good reasonable goal, if you're not there already, is just start with a two years. So that's a even at two turns per year, that's a six-month time supply of everything on the shelf. So uh, that, and of course, the way to measure that is just taking your total annual issue dollars and dividing that by the total inventory dollars on hand, and that'll give you a sense for what your turns are. Um, of course, that therein lies some of the question uh, about inventory quality data. So, if you don't have a good handle, uh, a number uh, uh, data that you can trust and hang your hat on for issue value, issue quantity, and on hand value, it's, it's hard to measure returns. Obviously. Next is net position. I want to talk about that just just briefly. I think this can really help you avoid unnecessary purchases. So, and, and basically, that is that is the your on hand quantity for any particular part, plus the quantity you have on order, minus any pending requisitions you have. And that's that's the piece that a lot of a lot of uh, companies miss is that they know what they have, and they know what they have on order, but they they don't know how many requisitions for those parts are out there sitting on work orders and things like that. So anything you can do to tie those three things together to know what is what is your current position on those parts, that'll help you make better decisions on how many you really need to have on stock and how many you need to replenish today. And then critical spares, of course, that's probably one of the first things you want to look at when you begin to think about how can we optimize and start to right size the inventory? And we don't want to we don't want to leave ourselves short on a critical spare that's going to shut our plant down for an un unacceptable period of time. So, and and really, you're you're the ones that have to decide what's an an acceptable duration for you. For some, it's an hour. For some, it's a few days. But define what that is, and then identify those items in your system and then everything else then we can take and use more analytical approach to say based on your usage based on seasonality and things of that nature we can we can start to dial in on the what your your on hand value might be a more optimized value for these parts and then i want to talk briefly about average on hand quantity versus recommended on hand quantity very often times we see a big gap between these two. And that average on-hand quantity is really nothing more than taking your current max and your current min, uh, taking, uh, subtracting your min from your max, dividing that by two, and then adding the min. So basically I'm saying, what is the level of inventory that's right in the middle of your min and max? And so if you did that calculation for every item you have in stock, you'd, you'd know what Based on your min and max, at any point in time, what your average on-hand quantity might be for your whole inventory. And what we see very oftentimes is that if we compare that to really what you might call your recommended on-hand quantity, which might be, regardless of what your min and max says, what is your weekly usage or time supply uh, look like? So if you take your weekly usage and let's say you use two a week, 
and you know that your des your desired week uh, time supply is, I know I want to have a three week supply at all times. So that's six, plus whatever safety stock you might want to add in there, maybe one or two. So call it eight. What we see is that the gap between what you would think your recommended on hand quantity is and your average on hand quantity is is very oftentimes much different. So um, I would just recommend you want to look at that to see are my min maxes currently driving toward really what what my recommended on hand quantity is based on the the, the number of uh, weeks time supply that I want and the and the weekly usage that I'm that I'm using right now. So next, I want to talk about uh, just give you an example of what this might mean to you in dollars and cents. So here's an example of, of a company, very typically might have 1.2 million worth of inventory on hand. This is MRO spare parts usually we're talking about. Very typical. That's probably somewhere in the range of 5,000 SKUs. Again, very typical. Some of you, I'm sure, have way more than that, but some less. But that's just an average. What we see very very often is that 50% of the inventory is either dead or slow. So you really can't look at that inventory as being a source for burn off where you're going to try to optimize your inventory. You might be able to sell some of that inventory for, you know, probably pennies on the dollar, quite honestly, maybe 10% or so. But uh, ultimately, in, in the grand scheme of, of trying to really implement a, inventory optimization strategy, your dead and slow inventory is, isn't probably going to help you much. It's the active inventory that, that really we want to focus on. And very typically, let's say it's 45% active and you've got, let's say, 5% critical spare parts. That those are, those are parts you just know you have to have all the time. So in this particular example, 45% of your active inventory is turning once a year. Again, we see this pretty often. So that means your entire inventory is even turning slower than that. But let's just, for, for the sake of this example, let's say that your inventory is turning once a year. That means that you've got $540,000 worth of inventory, active inventory on the shelf. That's 45% times 1.2 million. So $540,000 represents a one-year time supply. So what if you could go to, let's just say, even a six-month time supply. Six months is a long time for active inventory. That's a, that's a long time, unless you have just extreme seasonality in your business where you need to make sure, or there's a tremendous amount of unpredictability in what parts you're going to use. Six months is a long time. But just conservatively, let's say you go to a six-month time supply. So now, so now you're going to not, not a one turn per year, but two turns per year for that amount for that active inventory. What dollar amount of inventory would you need to have on your shelf then to be able to experience that two-year, uh, that is that six-month time supply? Well, it's, it's half. So instead of having $540,000 worth of active inventory on the shelf, you really only need $270,000 worth of inventory that's active on your shelf. So over a course of, let's say, a year or so, you have an opportunity to burn down $270,000 worth of active inventory just by managing more closely what that active inventory, uh, the, 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 uh, the reorder points and the, the order uh, mins and maxes and things. So there's, there's one uh, very large opportunity right there that we see quite often, you know, opportunities to optimize inventory cost. The second key area I want to talk about is process cost. Uh, that was one of the, the three that we started off with. And the three key sources that, that we run into that, that drive cost, uh, process costs is one is item search time. That's a, that's a big one in a lot of places we go. That's the amount of time that a person actually physically spends trying to find a part. Secondly is PO processing time. That's the paperwork administrative side of the, the whole equation. And then third is travel time. This is physical time on a cart or on a tricycle or walking from, from place to place in the plant trying to find parts. 
and that just uh, it just goes into a big black hole. It seems a lot of a lot of companies don't measure that, um, and probably the accounting guys on the phone today uh, care less about process cost time than actual FTEs coming off their 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 uh, balance sheet. But for the maintenance guys on the phone, uh, process time means a lot. You, you want to spend your time turning wrenches, not finding, looking for, for parts, or, or uh, you know, spending time on travel time and things of that nature. So, so I want to spend just a few minutes talking about that. And here's some of the key things we wanted to cover here. And the number one, the, the first one there is downtime cost per hour. And right now, Rona, I want to. Uh, we had one more poll question I wanted to ask Rona to launch, if you don't mind. Sure. Okay, our last poll for today, uh, we're asking our listeners, has your company measured its cost of downtime or lost utilization? So we're just kind of wondering, do you have a means of tracking and are you currently measuring what it truly costs when um, equipment is, goes down? All right, so we're just looking for, yes, no answer here. Looks like about... 80% of the people have voted, so we'll leave it open for maybe another 10 seconds. Just type it right into your keyboard. Okay. Looks like all the votes are in, so let me share that. So, Dan, um, 41, we have an almost 60-40 split, but about 41% say they are measuring the cost of downtime and 59% are saying they don't currently measure the cost of downtime or lost utilization. Okay, very good. Thanks for that feedback, everyone. Yeah, and that and for those that do measure uh, your cost of downtime, that can very oftentimes, as you know, that can be a big number. Um, so for those that don't, I just, it would just be an encouragement that if you're looking to cost justify some, some implementations around better inventory management or process costs or purchasing spend, you know, anything like that, this is a, a, a large area and financially that can impact the company once you, uh, once you start to look at what your actual downtime is and the cost. So appreciate your feedback. Um, some of the other key areas in terms of what to measure relative to process costs. One is sourcing time. That's the, the amount of time that a company spends actually finding suppliers for new parts and things like that. Or PO processing time. That's just the time that that uh, from from uh, from from need identification of need to actually issuing the PO uh, that amount of time. Travel time, of course, is you know you typically on site. You know, very often times you know I I, I hear stories, I, I witness things uh, where a person needs a, a part, and that's an excuse for his buddy to jump on the golf cart and ride along and catch a donut on the way to the, to the break room. So ways to manage that better, I think, can, can impact your business significantly. Item search time, of course, this is one that we see quite a bit. This is a, it's a big problem for a lot of companies that, that maybe don't have as, as tight a handle as, as they'd like to on, on control of the inventory, identifying clearly where things are in the, in the database, inside your e system so that finding parts is very painful and time consuming. Issuing time, um, biggest challenge here that we run into is just that a lot of companies are going to an unmanned uh, inventory management environment and for, for cost reasons, for cost containment, and the big challenge is how do we drive the right process and, and discipline among the, the guys that are pulling inventory now to actually record parts issues to work orders when they do take parts. That's a big, big challenge. Uh, and then lastly, just, you know, there's a lot of other time consuming activities, you know, such as, you know, trips to, you know, in the in the company truck down to the Home Depot to get parts and things like that. So we see a lot of that happening. But those are some of the key things to measure when we look at process cost. I wanted to present to you briefly one way to measure process cost, and I'll, 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 we call it our top-down analysis, and I'll compare that to a bottom-up. And it, probably a lot of you here today have, have sat in or been party to meetings where you sat around a conference room for 
maybe many hours, if not days, and you did a very detailed flow chart, step by step of every intricate step that happens in a particular process. And it took very uh, took a long time. Uh, it was very accurate, but it took a long time. It's a big investment. And so at the end of that process, you were able to measure what is the, your total time investment and money and, and, and resources to, to do whatever that process is that you've mapped. A lot of companies don't, don't want to spend that amount of time and effort coming up with a, a, a cost, especially if you're, you're looking to quickly move something forward to, to get a general feel for what is your cost saving opportunity. So one way to look at that might be a top-down analysis. This is what we, we, we oftentimes do when we go in and we do a, an activity-based cost analysis. So this, this slide here is an example of that. So if you can picture a spreadsheet where the spreadsheet has uh, on the left column the functional area. So you see there end user. And you may have other functional you know, Obviously, you'll have uh, areas like accounting and receiving and uh, uh, shipping, those kinds of areas. Each functional area you'd, you'd identify in your company that touches the MRO management process. So you'd identify those first. And then the next column over is the number of individuals within that functional area that touch the MRO process. And then by kind of a, a series of surveys you, of your key people in each area, you'd, you'd then get them to you'd, 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 you'd lay out the activities for the functional area. And you can see on the right there, ID, part, and supplier, place the order, log the item, receive parts, and so on. These key activities. If you go to your key people that, that would be representative of this functional area and you ask some questions and just say, for these key activities in the, in the, in the area of MRO management, how much of your day do you spend managing these activities? And put that percentage down. So this, in this particular example, end users, these are the guys, the technicians, let's say, that actually are using the parts. They spend 50% of their day in one of these activities. Okay, And then you would then equate that to the, uh, the full-time equivalent, the FTE there. So that of the 25 folks in that functional area, there are 12 and a half people that use that are, that are uh, at time spent in the MRO management area. And then take a fully loaded average salary of that person, so that's a fully loaded you know, 50000 including benefits and things. And that is your extended cost there, the next column over, $625,000 worth of process costs just being spent on those key areas. So you can go through that and quantify that pretty quickly and get a pretty good idea of what your your cost is uh, and time invested in your activity around MRO. And then it gives you a way to, to then, uh, looking at the pie graph, look where most of this time is being spent. In this particular case, 45% of their time was, was logging the parts. It was, it was a you know, totally manual process. It was paper-based, and it was very painful for them. It took, took them you know, the last hour of their day and first hour of the morning, they were doing nothing but that. And then, of course, it's all throughout the day, too. So this is a great way, uh, pretty quick way to get to your, your cost of, of process. OK? So here's an example of what that might look like. And so in the previous page, we looked at $625,000 worth of annual process costs, which are made up primarily of those, those PO processing, item search and travel time, those activities. Um, and then we're not even talking about downtime yet. That downtime is a process cost that, that that's money that's just going away and lost production and lost everything else. That can be a big number. But just on the 625,000, if you could reduce that m amount of processing time by adding technology, getting better consistency and adherence to your processes, uh, reducing that by 25%, which I think is, you know, it, it, depending on where your starting point is, can be very reasonable. Um, you could reduce your process cost about 156,000 in this particular 
example. So, so that's one way to look at total process costs and ways to to uh, reduce uh, your process cost there. Okay, and the last thing I wanted to touch on is on the purchasing side. And three key sources there that we see quite a bit that, that sources of increased spending. Number one is a fragmented supplier base where, you know, very often times we go into ca uh, case scenarios where a client has two, three hundred, sometimes upwards of five hundred different suppliers that they're buying from for all of their MRO uh, parts. Lots of three bid and buy process going on and you basically very, very unleveraged spending. So lots of POs and very difficult to get uh, volume pricing from, from suppliers when you're spreading it so thinly across that broad of a supply base. So that's number one uh, cause. Secondly is, is just this idea of just in case buying. It kind of goes along with the not knowing what we, what we own as well is, is buying uh, based on a gut feel ba versus uh, usage, truly usage based buying so that we have information that helps us know when we're supposed to buy something as opposed to just in case. And then buying around the inventory is a, I think we touched on, but that, that largely impacts your purchasing cost too. You're, you're adding purchasing costs uh, for something that you already own. You just don't know where it is uh, or that it's on the, on the premises. Key things to measure here, total MRO purchasing spend. Uh, you know, one, one key point here is there's very few companies on the phone here, I'm sure, today that, that don't know how to manage what their purchasing spend is. You, you, I would say 99% of everyone knows how much they're spending. Um, one, one word I would add, though, about uh, purchasing on pro cards, that can be a, a great way to decrease your cost of a PO. And probably a lot of you use them today, but just bear in mind, you're, you, very oftentimes, usually, you're losing that line item detail visibility to what it is that you're buying on that on that PO. So just think about that as you as you implement uh, and decide when to use a pro card and when not to. I've, I've, you know, in several cases, I've talked with clients that that use pro cards almost exclusively, and they're very much uh, blind to what the what the line item detail of what it is they're buying, so it makes it very hard to manage that on a, uh, if you want to get into the detail of what am I buying exactly. So just something to keep in mind as you think about that. Of course, your quantity of suppliers, that's something to keep, keep track of. Um, the idea here is you know, buy from those, those suppliers that can, can provide the best service, of course, a good price but one that's leveraged, that you're going to get uh, good volume discounts from, that you can hand as much business to this uh, quality uh, supplier that you can. That's, if Dan, you do that, that's going to imp Go ahead. Oh, sorry, Dan. We just had uh, a few listeners asking what a pro card is or a pro card. Would you just mind defining that for us? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's a, uh, a credit card, a, a procurement card. So a lot of companies carry like a company credit card to go out. They might have a you know, $1,000 limit or a $5,000 limit, depending on what level of uh, authorization they have, but it's a credit card. Gotcha. Okay, we're all familiar with that then. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, of course, limiting your number of suppliers is just by its very nature uh, probably going to optimize your quantity of POs um, and also is going to impact your frequency of POs, and it's going to increase your line items per PO. So all of those things, you know, along this line of thinking of buying less often and buying for less, those, those that really impacts that heavily. So that helps you buy less often, and it's and it's going to impact your purchase price as well. So just things to keep in mind as you as you as you take a look at where you're spending your money and how broadly and how thinly you might be, be spreading it across your supply base. That's a, that's a great place to focus in on. Here's an example here of what we very oftentimes see going into a client scenario and looking at their, their purchasing spend and, and where it's spread. We, I lovingly call this our hockey stick chart because the, that blue bar uh, line there looks like a hockey stick, but 
you can see the the top ten suppliers in this particular case only represent fifty one or that is forty one percent of their total spend. So that's a pretty low percentage of 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 your of the spend. And the the other one hundred and ninety three suppliers are making up the majority of the spend. So ideally, you'd want that to be reversed. You'd want to have a lot more spend going through your top ten suppliers and really getting the, the, the most out of your purchasing uh, strength and your leverage to, to, uh, to get that, your, your piece price down, but not only that, impact your processing time and cost as well. So I think if you're starting from a, a scenario that looks similar to this, a 10% reduction is not at all unreasonable to expect when you start to shift you know, big amounts of spend over to your key suppliers and motivate them. And it gives you a lot of uh, negotiating power as well. So 10% on a $1.4 million annual spend, which again, very typical for MRO inventory. Uh, $140,000 savings, very attainable. I would see that uh, very easy to do. So just to wrap it up, um, you know, the three areas we talked about today, just in the example, again, very typical. Um, you're, you're, uh, you'll want to plug your particular numbers in to the scenarios we talked about today, but this is a very typical scenario we walk into. There's a potential of a, over a half a million dollars worth of a savings opportunity when you lump the inventory process and purchase savings opportunities together. So if you're looking at doing, you know, a, a significant project around inventory, um, this is a great way to, to to bring some, you know, documented, quantifiable savings opportunity to your executive committee to uh, to get some funds to to make those improvements. So that's all I had on the on the presentation. I'll I'll stop there and ask if there are any questions at all. Great. Okay. Thanks, Dan. And again, to our listeners, um, Dan has agreed to stick around if we have some additional questions for him. And so please go ahead and type them into the, um, into the questions feature and go to webinar. And one question that I'm wondering, um, and also I did want to reiterate for our listeners that uh, Dan has agreed to send a PDF of the presentation because uh, there's a lot of information in here that you may want to refer back to. So he'll send that out at the conclusion. And those of you that wish to communicate with him directly, he's also put his um, uh, his uh, email address and contact info there. Dan, in your experience for people that aren't um, uh, that aren't currently measuring their inventory, how long does it take you to get started and how long a period before you start to see the, the results you're talking about, the improvements that you see? Well, in terms of getting started, that, that can be uh, the, the number one challenge, of course, for probably everybody on the phone is, is resource constraints. Uh, you know, we're, we've gotten about as, as lean as we're going to get. Uh, and uh, so having the resources on staff available to go through and build the inventory data and, 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 and set this foundation can be daunting. So that can take uh, for some, some spend a year doing that. This is one of the reasons we're in business to help jumpstart or an outside company such as PM2 or you had some resources available you know, it can happen within a you know a number of a few weeks, six to eight weeks, typically. When if we talked about that kind of typical scenario, five thousand uh, line items of, of parts, that's very typical. And then in terms of And then at least in a six-month period, begin to identify which ones can we look at to maybe uh, uh, massage our min-max levels for the ones that are moving anyway and begin to optimize that. And then probably after about the first year, you'd, you'd begin to 
really sink your teeth into it and 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 uh, get some more serious savings. But you really need, I would say, about six months worth of history to 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 make some informed decisions without accepting too much un risk of of shutting your plant down. Okay, that's good to know. Gosh, we've had several questions come in, so I'm going to fire them off here. Uh, one listener is asking, what are your thoughts, Dan, on consignment inventory? Well, let's see. Well, from, a, from, a, from an inventory standpoint, it's great because that inventory is not on your books. From a availability standpoint, of course, now that supplier has the inventory on his book. So if that supplier is willing to stock levels to your specifications and, you know, thereby guaranteeing that they're not going to ever stock less than, than what your recommended quantity is, then I would say that could work well for you. Uh, the, the, the temptation on the supplier side, though, is to minimize his inventory as much as possible. So I just I would say we, you know, you'd want to be careful to make sure that you're going to get the service that you want and the availability that you want on consignment. That's a good point. It's kind of a, a trade-off. Um, we had another question come in uh, where you were referring, Dan, to limiting the number of suppliers. But then there's also pressure from our listeners to shop for the lowest price, which is, you know, how they ended up with many different suppliers. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? How do you kind of balance those two things? Best well, and, price I would... and limiting number of suppliers. Right, and and I, I think I think where where I land on that is I would start with with first understanding what what does it cost you to do the three three bid and buy process in terms of time time and resource um, number one, and then you know you, you may you may be pushing a uh, hundred POs a week on what might be smaller dollar volume purchases and spending nearly that uh, just processing them. So on the very large ticket items, I think you, you behoove yourself to, to try to get your best price and shop that around. But your day-to-day, -day, everyday, you know, 100 POs a week activity, I think, I think it makes good sense to try to drive the, the high frequency of POs which are generally going to be the lower dollar POs, you want to drive that toward a handful of suppliers and, and just understand that the trade-off that you're getting is, is on the, the cost of a PO side. So, a so there's, a, there's a balance there, certainly. And a related question is, um, do you need to, when you're measuring your inventory, account for every nut and bolt? Do you have some rules of thumb of... Is there a certain price point below which it's not really effective to measure them? Yeah, I I typically recommend not putting every nut and bolt uh, on the on the inventory. That's we typically would would set that aside as what we call free issue inventory. That would very oftentimes be physically located outside a controlled inventory environment, so any user can come up and take take what he needs. Um, the cost threshold varies by plant, but but you know I would say somewhere in the one to five dollar cost threshold. If it's if it's worth less than you know somewhere in the one to five dollar, um, you might consider just just letting that go and let that be free issue. Um, others have a you know in the military, especially uh, government, they they want to dial it in a whole lot closer than that. But uh, I I would say generally um, you wouldn't want to manage to that level of granularity on fasteners. Gotcha. Okay. Good to know. Again, it's that trade-off. Um, let's see. We have a couple more questions here. Uh, someone is asking if they want to start measuring the MRO parts and purchasing, what's the first thing they need to be in control of to realize the savings you're talking about, Dan? And how do you get started? 
four, can you say that one more time, Rona? Yeah, she's saying if you want to start measuring MRO in the purchasing department, what's the first thing you need to be in control of, or what's the first thing you would start measuring in order to start to achieve these savings? Oh, okay. Well, the the, the first thing, the, the biggest number on the on the on the board is going to be the purchasing spend. If you don't already know that, what is your purchasing purchasing spend, and and being able to no, this kind of goes to the the pro card, the, the credit card that we that we talked about. Having line item detail to what it is you're buying. So, how much am I buying? That's the biggest number in the room. How much am I spending? And then, then from there, how much the the, the kind of a subset below that is how it gets to the process side of it. How often do I purchase and begin to understand uh, the process side? But the biggest number in the room is the the, the top line spend. So if you don't know what that is accurately, that's the first thing you'd want to get your hand on. Great. Okay. We appreciate that. Someone is asking if you recommend using vendor managed inventory for the small items that you don't track levels on. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yes, I do. Um, I think it's a great <laughs> idea. Um, here's some things to just be keep in mind. Um, there are, uh, depending on which vendor it is, different vendors have different incentives in place for their folks that are actually doing this work. Some, uh, I think the vendor that you want is the one that doesn't pay their person any kind of a commission to stock your bins. So if they're being paid, on a, uh, as a salesperson to go out there and replenish your bins, that person is motivated to completely max you out. Um, what you really would like to have, the t ideal scenario, is someone who is strictly a service, he's not paid, he's, he's a service-oriented uh, individual, they're not, they're not paid any kind of commission for sale, and they're measured on the quality of service that they provide. That's, that's who you want to do your, your vendor managed inventory. Vendor managed inventory can be a wonderful, wonderful way to take time and energy out of your scenario and put it on the shoulder of a supplier, which is another great reason to try to drive a, the, a large amount of purchasing through a small amount of a small number of vendors to motivate them to provide these kind of services for you. And the other thought I would add to that is, I would recommend not uh, having ten different suppliers doing VMI vendor managed inventory in your in your space. That is that is generally winds up with chaos. So pick one or two of your key providers that can do a good job for the stuff that, that you want to have them manage for you, and they have the right motivations in place that they're not paying or motivating and incenting their people to max out the levels on your shelves. Okay, that's very helpful. Um, someone is asking about if you don't currently have a controlled environment inventory, do you pursue that first before you try to get your arms around? Like, I guess is, I think what he's asking is, is a controlled environment inventory needed before you can really start to measure and improve. Yeah, this is this is the, the probably the most frequent challenge now especially where companies have have they've gone away from full-time staff storerooms many many of them have. So we're going into a whole new world with really a you know we're depending on the the discipline and process consistency of the end user to do what he's supposed to do to make sure that the product is is issued and so forth. So yes, I would say if you, if you if you're not confident that you're going to have a a controlled process, then it would be a lot of work, uh, probably for not to to invest a lot of money, you know. In, in inventory. So we want to make sure that if it's not a physically controlled space, which I recommend, um, we we want to make sure that 
that you've got buy-in from the guys that are going to be pulling on these on this inventory and good practices. And you know, you you're the only one that can can know that. You know, what is the culture in your in your company today for change? You know, is there is there uh, is there going to be significant buy-in, or is there going to be big-time pushback to get to get the uh, the technicians signed up and, and using the process. So yeah, I, that's a big, big challenge that, that you want to get your arms around before you invest a bunch of money to fix it. Absolutely. All right, well, we have time for another question or two. Um, one, this relates back to um, an earlier um, question when you were talking about the length of time before you start to see the payback and typically how many people and what are the roles of the people that are involved in a project such as this? I guess he's asking about how many people really need to be working on inventory. It's not just the project, but what kind of resources do you need to plan for? Okay. Um, there are a couple, couple aspects there. I'll, uh, the first is kind of the physical setup or the data setup uh, of it as well. So let's let's use the same example we've we've been playing with this this hour, which is a case where you have let's say five thousand unique parts on the shelf. So very typically, if if we were going to come in and do that for you, or if you were going to try to do that in house, you'd need a team of four to six individuals for probably four to six weeks, somewhere in that range, to to address the physical, uh, and this is another webinar, <laughs> but you know, address the physical uh, uh, limitations in the room, make sure everything's organized, getting it into a, a, a well-organized state, getting it into a database, loading it into e-maint, uh, barcode labeling the parts, counting it, all those things. You know, all that needs to take place in that, that six-week time frame so that you've got a, a solid foundation to uh, to work from. And then beyond that, the other recommendation that, uh, that I always make is that if you're if you're in a, a scenario where you don't have a manned storeroom, and that's more more often than not the case, where there's no manned storeroom, the thing that we want to make sure that companies recognize is that just because you don't have a manned storeroom doesn't mean you don't need to have a managed MRO environment. Somebody in your company still has to be responsible for that process um, to, to make sure that the, the, the people are held accountable to the process that you set forth and you know uh, all the rest. Receiving gets done and, and uh, uh, adherence to all the the processes. So, don't forget to assign an individual, at least one. And this isn't necessarily a full time job, but somebody's got to be the owner of this to drive accountability and and sustain that change that you're making. Sage advice. Well, Dan, I'm afraid we're at the top of the hour. <laughs> we still have lots more questions, but um, I want to be respectful of people's time, and so. Uh, uh, I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions today, but I promise that we will follow up with you after the session. Several people um, uh, had some specific uh, inquiries for you, Dan, that I'll make sure we share. So again, I'd like to thank everybody. I'd like to especially thank Dan for putting together this presentation and taking some time to uh, educate us all today. And thanks to all our listeners there. Um, we do have a brief survey at the end. Uh, we want to make sure that these sessions are really addressing topics that are important to you and you know help you be successful. So we always include a question, what, are the, what other topics can we have Dan or our other guests uh, speak about that would be really our top of mind to you. So thanks again, Dan. Um, it's always a pleasure. And thanks and, to you, uh, Ron. Appreciate it. Okay, and thanks to our listeners, and uh, we'll follow up after the session and make sure that we um, uh, that we have we follow up and get you answers to all your questions, as well as follow up with a link to the recording. So, thanks everybody. This is Rona E. Maint and Dan Flown from PM2, and we hope we'll see you the next time. Take care.